All right, guys, let's do this. Let's do the uh, season three, episode seven, trench art or trench art. Cody, you want to jump on? Join us. We'll see you yeah. got you, okay, we'll get John on one. We should work Neither do we. Because he, he, <laughs> on something that's a little more technical, like, for sure, he'd be great Just to have. Looking, looking busy back there. Yeah, perfect. Perfect. <laughs> All right, AK Heads, we're back. Is is it Das Vidania or is that bye or is that hello? How do you say hello in Russian? Anybody know? I think, I think it's hello. <laughs> Just Hello. Hello, comrades, from the Talking Lead Lead Quarters in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. <laughs> we are back with the Talking Lead AK Corner. This is Season 3, Episode 7, and we're going to be talking trench art today. I guess this can be classified as trench art. I don't know. I, th I think there's several different definitions in what people classify as trench art, but that's what we're calling it, and we're going to stick with it. Uh, but we got to thank our sponsors first off. And my co-host, as always, Brian Keeney with Occam Defense Solutions. Welcome stoked. in, Brian. So stoked to be here again. Thank you for having me. Glad glad you're here. So you're in the workshop. See, see Cody running around back there doing some work, getting things uh, lighted, lit up for the uh, Occam Defense 1775 customers that are anxiously awaiting their little babies. Yeah, we're doing a... Um, a, a an airdrop to behind enemy lines in California. They've got a, a little bit of a web there, you know, that cripples the pistol grip, but other than that, they're pretty awesome. And uh, hopefully that whole thing goes away soon. I think there's some well, there's the policy coalition and a bunch of other folks have in the 2A. You well, know, the judge just event. ruled that uh, they, all their shit's unconstitutional. So, you know, their assault weapons ban is unconstitutional. So we'll see how that goes. Yeah, my eight-year-old knew that, but these adults appear to be a little slow in learning what shall not be infringed means, and hopefully they can catch up. Well, yeah, hopefully uh, the law will prevail, but who knows? Uh, Occam Defense Solutions, uh, one of the sponsors for the Titan Lead AK Corner for the past two years, and we greatly appreciate that. Check them out, OccamDefense.com. And get get that 1775 you've heard so much about. We'll probably see a couple as the show progresses. Uh, come up for some inspections. Yep, and we got a, a new coupon code to announce for the lead heads that we'll do at the end here. Uh, Whoa. Yeah, yeah so, so stay tuned. Hell yeah, I think we might have some Occam lube that we're going to be giving away too and some other things. So yep. stay tuned for that. Uh, another one of the sponsors of the Talking Lead AK Corner Season 3 is Factory 47, and joining us again this episode is James Balzac with Factory 47. James, welcome in. What's up, everybody? Thanks for having me. Good to be back. Glad to have you back, and uh, a little change of scenery there, it looks like. Yeah, we're in the, uh, we're in the studio today, uh, kind of been working on our podcast, getting things going, so yeah, checking out the uh, new studio. And who you got with you? You got a joiner there. And can y'all get closer together? Because we're getting like half and half. Well, I guess. Get I guess he kind of, you know. I, I guess we'll pretend like we're friends. We're uh, yeah, company. this is Tony. Yeah, this is uh, this is Tony Haynes, a uh, buddy of mine. And, uh, you know, he knows some things about today's subject matter. So a little bit about everything. That Tony, we bring him on. We appreciate you joining us. Looking forward to... To picking your brain, man. Well, thank you. Yes, sir. Do you want to give any kind of background or anything, or we just you're just gonna be a mystery? Uh, just a mystery. Okay. Just a collector of everything, kind of a man he, of mystery. He's a he's an AK enthusiast, you know, a collector. So he's uh he's always researching this kind of stuff. So it's a good fit for today's episode. Yeah, I was gonna say you're fitting great with this this crowd. And you talked about a podcast. So tell us about uh, this podcast that. You're doing again 
fuck you because I don't need the competition, but thanks. <laughs> well, so it's 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 not a competition. Uh, I've, I've actually been working on this as a, as a project for a long time, kind of a fun thing I wanted to do that's not necessarily related to specifically to the gun industry. It's uh, more male interest, you know, all encompassingly. So uh, it's panel format with a bunch of friends called the American Barbarians. And uh, it's, you know, some kind of rough around the edges dudes that uh, get I together and talk like about male spot, interest yeah. stuff. Yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty fun. There's a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of philosophy, history type stuff, good debates. Uh, and it's just, like I say, it's all male interest. And most of the people involved come from uh, different walks of life, from emergency services to past military or different things like that. So uh, typically kind of brutish or blunt barbarian type people. And, uh, you know, if you're easily offended, it might not be the place for you. But uh, for everyone else, we like to say subscribe to join the tribe. Okay, I like that. And where can they do that? Uh, we're at, we just launched, so we're actually in pretty much all the podcasting apps so far, except for Pandora and uh, iTunes. But those are coming in the next week or two. And uh, we're also on YouTube. Everything is uh, at the American Barbarians, and we're also on Facebook and Instagram. So, okay, yeah, I'll we're put a link in our show notes uh, for you that are listening, uh, so you can quickly connect to that. And you got one episode out so far, right? Uh, two are up and the third one's going up tonight. So, uh, oh, probably man. by the time this episode goes up, we might have four. You'll we're, catch me before we're moving. I <laughs> <laughs> uh, appreciate funny. the plug. Thank you very much. No, absolutely. And then you've got something else that we're going to plug a little later. Remind me. Okay. Wasn't there? Got some new, new stuff coming. Oh, yes. Yes. I was like, what are you talking about? Yeah, absolutely. Should yeah, we talk I about it now you. before you forget about you. it? <laughs> sure we're gonna launch some new uh a couple of new designs coming up uh i'm gonna actually post them on the social media and, and uh and probably about two weeks we're waiting on a little uh little thing yet but there'll be um a flag and some new shirt designs and some hoodies and stuff to come with it but i think you're gonna really like the design and uh it's all i'm gonna really tell you about that right now but i'll uh i'll get some coming your way too so you can uh you can rock it it's gonna be sweet and for those watching on our, our video, I am wearing the AK Corner design that James did for us for this uh, this podcast. Talking about AK Corner. Uh, and then it's got stuff on the back. I'll see if I can turn around here. Can you see the back? Yeah. Yeah, it's clear. You can see all the proof marks for all the countries or factories of origin. So factory47.com. And a special discount code for you leadheads is leadhead. Use leadhead, you're going to get 10% off there at Factory 47. Uh, Non-sale items, right? No sale. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. I'm looking forward to uh, the new design. All right. And then also, uh, Seal One, we're going to be giving away a big old Seal One package today to one of you lucky listeners. Uh, it's got their paste, it's got their liquid, it's got a brush, it's got the the pre-soaked uh, pads in there, and it's got a little cleaning rag in there also. We're going to be giving away one of those to you, uh, Lucky Leadheads, seal1.net. Uh, CLP, clean, Lou protect. Seal one and done is what they like to say. You uh, put it all over your gun once, you wipe it off. It's a dry lube and cleaner. And it works really good. I just cleaned a couple of guns today. Um, using this seal one.net and that code is leadhead you get 25 percent off at seal one and then mission first tactical has their awesome dump trays um, that we're going to be giving away one of these today as you can see since our subject is trench art i've got some grenade launcher shells here that well, these are from Atlas defense and I've got vodka in there in honor of the Talking Lead AK Corner. So cheers to you guys. Here's here's shot one. Ah, good stuff. Uh, but Mission First Tackle doesn't do the uh, shot glasses. They do the dump trays, or they could be serving trays, or they could be your armorer's trays. Uh, and they've got the awesome logo that you just saw on the Factory 47 t-shirt. Um, you can get those Mission First Tactical. Of course, they do the AR furniture. They do magazines. Uh, i got cool magazines right here, AR-15, AR-10 magazines. 
uh, that you can get there, missionfirsttactical.com. And that code is LEADHEAD, and you're going to get 20% off at Mission First Tactical. Uh, and then not joining us this episode is IWIUS, is a sponsor of the Talking Lead podcast as well, AK Corner. We had Jeremy on last episode, which we did the AK versus the AR, <laughs> which was an awesome episode. We had Brian and James were both on that. We had Curtis Houseman with VSO Gun Channel. Uh, and then we had um, Jeremy with IWI, and we had the AR-15 podcast guys. We had uh, Nick Dooley and Nick's friend Garth, which Garth didn't say much, did he? <laughs> he was he was, wow. he was smart. Yeah. No, it, that was a real fun time. I enjoyed that episode mightily. What a nice group of people. Yeah, we had a good time with that. I've had several people ask for a rematch. Uh, who who did we decide won that? Was the AK the winner or the AR? Was it decided? Well, I was just looking at the outline here, and I see that that was kind of the next thing on here. But I I was thinking to myself, you know, since how none of the AR guys are back on the show today, we can just sort of declare ourselves the winner, and they can't really deny that. So <laughs> That's true. I think we just roll with AK and call it good no matter what happens. We're graceful winners around here. You know, or great <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was it was a great show. It was a fun time. Really enjoyed that. And I would I would like to do that again. I think we've still got some uh, some areas that we could talk about and uh, get into both of those those platforms again. But great what I thought was neat about it was despite uh, no matter who won or lost or what was said, like you learned so much from both platforms from the episode. Um, both being on the show and going back and listening to it. So it was absolutely a huge value, and I could see that being the same type of value doing a rematch. Absolutely, yeah. Um, uh, I think everybody would be up for doing it again, too. And maybe we'll bring in – I'll let each team pick another – you know, they can pick somebody else to bring in, you know, kind of their uh, their ace in the hole, you know, kind of thing. Phone, phone a friend. <laughs> I like that. Phone a friend, yeah, exactly. That would be awesome. But get, if you guys didn't get a chance to go to listen to that, go back. Um, it was a couple of episodes back, last month's AK Corner. Um, and we gave away a, a whole lot of stuff there. IWI had several packages. James had several packages. Um, all kinds of cool stuff. Mission First, Seal One. Oh, and I gave away a, uh, a Gosley Super Stabby thing that I haven't mailed yet. So whoever won that, I'm sorry. Uh, I'll get that out this week, I promise. Um, it goes, uh, it's like an attachment that goes on your AR. Did you guys see this? Did I show it to you last week? It's like for a bayonet. Yeah, right. So. That's awesome. You can put that on your AR and, uh, pretend like you got an AK. <laughs> 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 the super stabby thing. Uh, but we're gonna, we're gonna learn a lot this episode too. I feel it's going to be a, a good episode. We're going to get into the, the trench art here. And, well, Jason Swar was supposed to have joined us from Skillset Magazine. If uh, you guys listened to that episode that I did with him uh, a while back, we kind of touched on a little bit about how he was getting into the the AKs and how uh, he was discovering the trench art. And that's really kind of what got me interested in doing this episode. But unfortunately, he is traveling while we are recording this. And uh, we'll try to get him on another episode. But... Uh, uh, he seems like he's got a, a wealth of knowledge to to offer to the show too. So, uh, but between the guests that we've got here, I think we've we've got it covered. So, let's kind of get into it, guys. Let's talk about trench art and what is trench art. What's what's the history of trench art? Anybody want to get into that? <clears throat> well, I think th that before you kind of really get going on that, you almost have to establish what trench like the words trench art mean um because i feel like it's just really different per person in in today's sense it's almost really broad and and, and kind of vague uh as an interpretation like i when i think trench art i really just kind of look at art on weaponry in general that that's been added later like it wasn't uh put on during the manufacturing process and maybe it was done, you know, during a battle or maybe it was done at a camp or maybe it was done, you know, back at, uh, you know, uh, you know, in, in times of peace. Um, but, you know, the term trench art could 
mean something different to a lot of people. Uh, Tony and I kind of had this talk the other day, and he he said it specifically refers to you know from the trenches of World War One, and that's where the words trench art come from. So I think it's kind of a one of those interesting things because I've always been on the impression that trench art is you know that could that could go all the way back to you know three thousand years ago on a knife or you know something well, like I that. Think so whatever yeah, the samurai did it. The samurai did, yeah. And I think if you go back through history, uh, and there's a saying out there that says, art and war are old companions. And I don't know who said it. I've, I've seen that quote several times. Um, but uh, I think, you know, since the beginning of time, you've probably got some form or fashion of, of what what we call trench art. And yeah, it was probably coined during World War I, um, but we, but it's always been, you know, we've always had it. And, you know, you look through history yeah. and you watch these History Channel shows and they show like Viking artifacts and, you know, there's, they've got things on their shields and, uh, you know, on their armor. They've got things that they've drawn on there. Well, so go ahead. Well, they didn't have serial numbers back then. So well, a lot of times their art wasn't distinguished. That's my sword. That's my, my shield. That's yeah, my property. That's Ronnie's, that's Ronnie's sword right there. That's Al's over exactly. there. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Come on, Ronnie, you got my sword again. Damn it. <laughs> I, I think back in the old days, that was a lot of what that represented. Um, but but generally, it was just to, to ornate, decorate your sword during boring times. Or your shield or whatever it may be. Yeah, whatever the term, it was. The term trench art is typically used to describe souvenirs that were manufactured by service members during World War I, World War II, uh, which some of the items were manufactured by soldiers, prisoners of war, and even civilians. Um, but it's become a, a quite a, a commercialized industry in and of itself, where a lot of these war-torn countries, you know, that's what they heavily rely on is, you know, getting these war scraps, leftovers that are there, and uh, turning them into art whatever form or fashion that may be and they make a living from that well during during wartime a lot of the a lot of the campuses that they were going to use wasn't available so they just used what they could find so a, a you know a piece of airplane wing a shell whatever they could do they just were trying to make money to sell it somehow just to scrape by and that's where a lot of the artisans during time especially civilians POWs did it to kill time. Soldiers did it during downtime. You know, it's the art of the warrior. You know, well, not just the warrior, but it's also the, you know the people that were there, the civilians um, that were there as well. Well, and there's there's something clearly restorative and helpful with regard to mental health with art. You know, it's it that's a, a very common occupational therapy. <laughs> right for people that have experienced trauma is to do art and one of the things that's really special and i don't mean in a good way about world war one was that a lot of those lines moved back and forth like a hundred yards at a time or something like the trenches were fairly fixed so you had and shelling was that was kind of you know it was an apocalyptic level of shelling specifically in world war one and the um, the CTE, you know, the, the, the brain injuries that those guys got were so horrific. And so I, I got to believe that the, you know, the, the terror brought on by shelling that I cannot imagine, but, you know, uh, Jocko Willink talks about the pure terror of being in a mortar attack, knowing that it, there's nothing you can do and that, that it, um, that it's just in God's hands. And that's a terrifying thing when you don't have, you know, any sort of agency. And so, uh, and good Lord, Marty's uh, showing a picture here of, of kind of a giant shell uh, cartridge casing dump. And yeah, there's just an amazing amount of ordnance dropped during that time. And so I think there, so the reason that people might be that might so heavily associate it with World War One is you have all of this scrap material and a whole bunch of time and no movement. So you didn't have to worry about grabbing this thing and humping it, you know, 10 miles the next day. So that 
between the the scissoring there of a lot of downtime, not a lot to do, and then the need to repair one's psyche. Um, I don't know, does that ring true for you guys as to motivations and sort of the opportunities afforded by, by World War One? Exactly. I think that, yeah, I think that um, is, a, is a good depiction of, you know, of how, how it kind of got started and where it, where it got its name. And, of course, you know, the vast leftover materials from that war with the shell casings and the, the tanks and the planes and the vehicles and just everything, the helmets, uh, you know, and then all the other things that accompany that, you know, all the other equipment, the canteens and the lanterns. And I mean, it's just, just an uh, unbelievable amount of just junk that was left behind that, you know, while this, the soldiers were there, they used it, like you said, maybe for uh, mental uh, stability, it helped them. Uh, James, you talked about earlier uh, when uh, they were injured and they were in the hospital, you know, it kind of gave them some things, to, something to do while they were getting better, either waiting to go home or return back to the war. Uh, and then, of course, the civilians gave them the opportunity to, uh, you know, try to capitalize on it and make some money, uh, even from the soldiers. Um, when soldiers would go to France, you know, there were shops that were specifically set up that had this, you know, this cool art that was made from the materials from the war, the, you know, the previous battles that were there and whatnot, and they would go and they would buy that. They would send it home to their loved ones, uh, you know, in the Pacific. Uh, I've read the story that, you know, with all the downed airplanes, the Japanese planes, the American planes, they would use the aluminum to make jewelry and just all kinds of, you know, different things. Um, you even see coins. Uh, they use coins from, you know, whatever area that they were in to, to decorate, you know, whatever, you know, whether they're making ashtrays, they're making lamps, they're making cigarette lighters. Uh, I mean, they were very innovative, too, in, in the items that they were making. And uh, you, you go through and look at some of this stuff, and you're just like, wow, just, you know, human ingenuity is remarkable. That's for sure. But I was uh, I was going uh, I was leading me to oh the Pacific people would even uh, do coconuts they would they would decorate coconuts and send them home to their loved ones uh, from the Pacific so uh, each I guess battalion was issued um, sign kits and it would have paint material you know paint brushes and different kind of paints and stuff like that and they would get a hold of that. And they would paint coconuts. And if you put the address of where you wanted to send it in America and you took it to your post uh, mail, your mail post there on base, they would send it without a box or anything. Just if you had the address on that coconut, they would send it to your house <laughs> from, <laughs> from the cool. Pacific. Yeah, I thought that was pretty cool. That is awesome. So there's actually there's museums that have those and you can go and sit and check them out. The National World War II uh, Museum, which is in New Orleans, uh, has, a, has a, from now until I think the first of next year, January next year, they've got a trench art uh, display. <clears throat> what do they call them in museums when they do a, when they do a thing? Oh, like an installation? Whatever. They've got like this special thing with the <laughs> trench art set up that you can go and, uh, and check out, and it's specifically World War One, World War Two, uh, World exhibit, War Two exhibit. <laughs> exhibit. Thank you. <laughs> That's what it's called. You're supposed to spit it out. <laughs> we're, we're still thinking of we, it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It took a minute. It took a minute, and uh, I'm going to share my screen because I've got a a little thing on that right now for our people that are watching this. Share screen. I need to find a better fluid way of doing this. And you guys aren't going to be able to hear this, but you'll be able to see it. So this is uh, an interview with the curator there. And uh, it literally says exhibit on that video. <laughs> <laughs> a few pieces here for you today that represent some of those sections. Now, as you mentioned, trench art has a long history. And this piece we secured 
uh, specifically to demonstrate that. And uh, this is a so World like War One shell. World War One shell. And it was very there. typical at the time for to have this deeply fluted. Uh, and you see a lot of those. Of the, I've seen the a shell, lot of those. Available. And to make vases of these things, you often find these in pairs on mantles. And look at the violin. Uh, and there. They were produced during Wait the till war. Wait till he gets to this violin. And also after the war to be sold as souvenirs at the battlefields in Europe. We also have another section that we call Made at Sea. Now, this is a rather large shell from a ship that served in the Mediterranean. And uh, probably this is an ashtray, could also be a small trash can. Could be a spittoon. Hard to say exactly. <laughs> Lovely work. And often you find that on shipboard material. Every ship in the Navy had a small machine shop aboard. So their access to tools was probably greatest than any other person. And, and they also, of course, were aboard ship. So whereas an uh, infantryman would say, well, am I going to make a shell out of this? I have to carry it along with me from, from day to day. I think not. On ship, you could set this aside in the machine shop. You could work on it when you had an opportunity. And you could produce some really amazing pieces. We have what certainly I think is an ashtray. Uh, this is made to the violin combining here. Combining these, uh, the men in his camp. So he was saying, perhaps, I'm getting tired of making these. Uh, I'd like to do something else. So this else. was a prisoner of war and that made He chose a very ambitious project. Wow, that made these. He actually manufactured this violin in the prison camp. He got the, the wood camp. from furniture, scraps, uh, carved it with tools that he improvised himself. The that glue was hide good. glue that he scraped off of the bottom of furniture. Uh, and so he was able to manufacture this, and he had the goal to make it, to have it finished by Christmas, and he did, and he was able to teach himself a few tunes <laughs> and... Uh, play a few melodies for the men in his camp. So that's just a, a little sample there. Uh, if you go to that website, it's very interesting. And this cat's got a couple of interviews and uh, he's really good and uh, interesting. I would love to have gotten him on the show, but I think he's probably too good to be on our show. I wouldn't want to embarrass him <laughs> with, uh, with our shenanigans. Um, but that's just a great example of, you know, some of the things that were created during wartime and it's, it's limitless. It's endless. The, the things that people made. And as you saw there, I mean, a violin, the dude made a violin while he's in a prison camp, just using whatever he could find. He, he, he repurposed the glue from furniture that he would take apart. Uh, amazing, amazing type Man. stuff there. So, um, you know, we talked about who made who made the trench art, kind of what is trench art. I think that kind of gets us a, a good idea. But uh, we specifically more want to focus on this episode on, of course, the AK, um, European, you know, weapons. When you get these parts kits and you see these engravings and things on there, some people are like, oh, how do I get that off there? You know, should I, poly you know, should I sand that off or, you know, whatever? Um, I think you're going to find that that's not something that you're going to want to do as we get into this. So let's just, uh, let's talk about your experience, James, with, with some of the AK furniture that you've run across and what, what we call the trench art or the, and, and maybe Brian, you want to talk about the reasoning why, and we talked a little bit about it. Tony said, you know, to mark their weapons, like, Hey, this is mine. Uh, don't touch it quick quick identification type type markings um but over in europe you know unlike here in america you know the, they had conscribed conscripted armies you know they were forced to serve and forced to be in, in the army their um i guess they're like here in america like you, your soldiers would get in trouble if they defaced their weapons or their equipment where you know then they didn't they didn't really give a shit so uh there's a famous expression from communism, they pretend to pay us and we pretend to work. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that 
it is imp socialism fails and communism especially just on logical grounds on a, on a number of levels but inefficiency is one of the things that it's best at and one of my theories on trench art is that um the more boredom you have and the less ability you have to heal that boredom the more trench art you'll get like just while we've been talking i've been doing google searches on trench art from various wars and if you type in global war on terror gwat anything like that in trench art you get nothing you get some digital art yeah. but you know there's a major difference with with gwat you know there were movies and you know people had video games and even you know i was watching uh, restrepo you know where they're deep in the Karengal valley they're still you know playing xbox and stuff yeah. and um so it wouldn't surprise me at all if you know if if you've got musical instruments and video games and movies and access to books that that trench art isn't going to really happen that much and you know you search vietnam and it's not there's some world war ii there's more and then world war one you know it's it's an enormous it's volume. things that they're doing the art on or i guarantee you those guys you know inscribe something on their xbox controller or their you know they, they had guitars and things over there or you know i guarantee those guys put some some stuff on there maybe but you know you just don't see the I, i'm not saying that this is a scientific way of doing it but no, you, you google for it you don't see the results and to tie that back around to the but i get what you're saying yeah yeah you know with I'm quite sure that the Communist Party was not interested in whether soldiers had um, adequate diversions and positive mental health activities and workout gear, right? You know, it's like you get shovel, that's it, you know? And anybody who uh, has taken the the uh, tactical shovel class from Sonny Pazikas knows you can do a lot of stuff with the Spetsnaz shovel, um, but that's all you got, you have shovel. And so, we see a lot of trench art on com block stuff. And that would be my suspicion as to why, other than not getting in trouble when you had to turn your, you know, turn your gear back in. One of the things that shocked me about, you know, if those people out in the audience who, uh, those builders out there will know there's two kinds of parts kits when you're buying an AK. There's matching serial number parts kits, and then there's non-matching. And the question is always like, where, how did they get unmatched? And what I've come to learn is that in a lot of units, they would um, they would democratize their cleaning and they would take all the bolts and throw them into a pile and all the bolt carriers throw them into a pile and get the whole batch cleaned. And the serial numbers weren't always matching at the end of it. And so I don't think there was a lot of pride of ownership and uh, and all that. Um, so the idea of marking this stuff up you know that that doesn't surprise me in the least. Yeah. Well, and and the key point there is there was no um, repercussions for them to do that. You know, there was no discipline or anything for them to, you know, dissuasion for them to not do it. So precisely. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that home for me. That point there exactly. Yeah. So, but I would I mean, you know I would cap off that yeah. just a little bit that uh, even even America uh, and and now. I'll, I'll I'll speak from the Air, Air Force perspective, which is the most, you know, like by the book, black and white, you know, dot every I, cross every T, you know, rules organization there is. Uh, even even them in Iraqi freedom uh, or enduring freedom, whatever, like, yes, everything is accounted for. And yes, everything has to be turned in. But if you came back and didn't have something, that did, you know was on the list you were supposed to turn in, you could simply just be like, casualty of war. Oops, you know I don't know where it's at, and and the repercussions in Iraq are a lot different than the re repercussions stateside. You know stateside, that's a big deal uh, in in the Air Force. That is in 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 I don't know about you know the the real branches of the military, but in in uh, in Iraq, that's not a big deal. That's like, oh, well, uh, OK, we'll have to fill out some forms and we'll have to do some stuff. But it's really not that big deal. So even repercussions uh, from, like you know, one of the most nitpicky situations isn't really that big of a deal. So I, I would I would say that I would agree with Brian that the the real um, 
you know, reason for, for this stuff is probably more based on boredom and not like, oh, I'm afraid to, you know, get in trouble while I'm, you know, in a foreign land. What are they going to do? Take away my birthday? I mean, you know, yeah. just, just my I, thoughts. And it was encouraged, you know, it was even encouraged, like, you know, for, for people in the hospitals, you know, that were that were injured. It was encouraged for them to do some sort of crafts or arts. You know, they actually mm -hmm. said and they would just use whatever materials that they had. And, um, you know, they would come up with these miraculous art pieces. Um, but Tony, do you have anything to add to that? Well, I, I think a lot of the trench arts fading in a way, why you don't see a lot of it during Operation Iraqi Freedom and stuff is just, it's gone onto polymer. People just want lighter weight guns, you know, more tactical, you know, so wood, <laughs> wood frame guns are just not there. So the canvases aren't there for them to do this on. And like I said, they, they got Xbox, they have cell phones, they, you know, they have things to occupy their time DVD. other than carving the girlfriend's name. Yeah. So, you know, that's why you don't see any of it during World War II, World War One. You know, when Vietnam there was downtime, I mean, you know, see some in Vietnam. Well, v Vietnam, Vietnam was really where like the Americans, the polymers started polymer guns. So they, they didn't really have to do that in the, the Viet Cong, though, they're like really great artisans. You don't see very much trench art coming out of the Viet Cong. Um, you do see some. Every, every, any if there's wood, they're going somebody's gonna carve in it. That's just the way it is. They're but carving on their helmets. You don't see a lot of it. They were doing stuff on their helmets. The Americans. Well, that's true. But I'm I'm just talking strictly on the guns. But yeah, on helmets, uh, making necklaces, stuff like that. Oh, there's a ton ton of that stuff going on. You know, one of the neat things too that uh, we haven't really touched on, but was it uh, you know World War II is the like 1911 pistols, putting the family portraits in the grips. Um, oh, yeah. that was kind of a you know, a really neat, uh, to me, that's trench art. Um, I think it's a really neat piece because that's people that are, they're thinking about their family or their loved ones back home and they're, they're taking that, them, them, them with them. They're taking them with them wherever they go. And, and, uh, I think it's, you know, I don't know the psychology, but I've never met anybody that did it, but I, th I think they're a neat piece because that's the, if you're drawing that piece out, if you're pulling that out, that's, um, things got real wild. And that's your last, you know, desperate move there. And you've got your family with you for that moment. And so I think that's kind of an interesting thing or piece of trench art. And I bring it up because we kind of got sidetracked talking about specifically wood carvings. And I, I think trench art's definitely a lot broader than just specifically wood carvings. I know like um, I don't really like to associate myself with any of the military stuff, but um, but in my limited time in the sandbox, like we had access to Maxim magazines and that was the closest thing we could get to, you know, pretty girls. So we ripped all the pictures out. We pasted them all over our, you know, rooms or tents or whatever we could. We hung them everywhere. And, you know, we could have easily enough glued those to a rifle stock or something else. They didn't have to be carved. Um, but, you know, that was what we did when we were bored. And so I, I definitely really, I personally, from my standpoint, really agree with Brian that it just comes down to, uh, boredom. If you have activities, you'll fill your time with whatever activities, um, you know, do the best job of filling time. Like we played a lot of Uno, not because we liked Uno, we just happened to have a deck of Uno cards handy. And so we played the hell out of it, you know? Yeah. Did you become like the national champion of Uno? No, I, uh, we, like we played the heck out of it. And right when I got good, we discovered that we could put camel spiders in a shoe box and make them fight. So we had WWF camel spider <laughs> smackdowns on Saturday nights. Awesome. And uh, that became like my main thing. Yeah. <laughs> what happened to the loser? Uh, you had to go catch a new camel spider. <laughs> <laughs> because they would fight to the death. <laughs> in in light oh, of yeah. the fire service of us, James, what is a camel spider? Um, it's like a, um, I actually think it's just some type of scorpion. It's got like a four way mouth and, uh, like it doesn't have like the traditional stinger thing, but it's got these little pinchers in the front and, uh, they can get, you know, a decent size enough to, to creep you out. And, um, you know, we discovered that they, uh, they like oh. milk and if you, uh, starve them for a week, you can get them to fight each other. <laughs> well, oh, these camel? things are 
gnarly, huh? I'm just Googling it now. This These things are... Oh, they're ugly. They're not a spider. They're a, they're in the scorpion family, and they're they're ugly. They're not fun. They're huge. Yeah, are, they can get they can get sizable. Is that a is that a bite right there? Oh yeah, my, it looks like the necrosis can be pretty real from these things. I I believe that's probably a lot from infection. Uh, but when they, they when they dig, I mean, like to say they have a four way mouth, so they can go like up and down and side to side, and they like to like kind of push in and then open like spread it open like uh, that little fortune teller thing he used to make as a kid you know on a paper and then like we used to feed them lizards and stuff and they eat them from the insides out no shit yeah i don't oh, like them i you know i think there uh, there's a similar creature probably the same exact thing run around southern california and places like that which you know serves california right but uh you know they're creepy i can only imagine they're a lot bigger in iraq we would have brought some back, you know, they would have. Oh, we did. Back in the we, we absolutely. So here's a story that I don't know if I should even tell, but I'm going to tell anyways. <laughs> and if it needs to be edited, fine. But uh, so I was, I was with some guys in the Air National Guard and we came back. We we're supposed to, you know, clean all our stuff, or whatever. And one guy didn't. So his bag of fire gear, um, when he got back, he just, you know, threw it in the locker. So this is in a fire department. So it's in like the, you know, the garage bay locker and that bag sat there for you know a couple weeks while he was on all his leave waiting to go back to work and so like the camel spider eggs that were in his bag had hatched and all these little camel spiders start showing up in the fire station and this is in like i'll just say it's in a cold state but this was summer so these things lasted a while and they they're hard to kill they're like hard to kill so for like months these things are popping up around the fire station in random places and it wasn't until we got our big cold spell, like in March, this is eight, nine months in that all of a sudden they just kind of slowly disappeared. But yeah, it was a, it was kind of an interesting time. It was like, dude, you, you, you didn't clean your bag. <laughs> it's good time. It's gnarly. <laughs> burnt all the bags. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It's like, it's like you've seen aliens, right? Yeah. It's, seen exactly what it's, like. it's like, there's always <laughs> one that survives somewhere. You know, it makes its way. It's, well, and these things it's look like thing right like, now. <laughs> these things look like for those listening, they look like that the gnarly face sucking creature thing. And if you get a close up view of their jaws, it's something out of hell. Like yeah. it's just really, <laughs> really, really, really watch, great. You ever watch Blade? Have you watched Blade? Blade, Blade three. The Trinity, mouth little Pomeranian. <laughs> See, now that we're talking about, I think I'm going to take my Occam rifle and I'm going to carve a camel spider trench art into my Occam rifle. I just think it's like a perfect fit. Hey, James, you're dead to me. Yeah. <laughs> you can, you can. I'm do, just trying uh... to make it badass. <laughs> how, do you, how do you make it more badass? You really can't, right? So I mean, I'll put a camel spider on it. And Serico, uh, camel to, spider on there. To, to quote action figure therapy, it's like a mustache with titties. There's nothing better. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no comment on that one. <laughs> no, no that's threw me. Alone. That, that threw me off the whole the whole topic there. So let's let's look at some examples of you know let's get back to um ak's this is the ak corner uh let's look at some examples and you guys have a couple there don't you um uh, a couple yeah chart ak furniture so some of the most like uh, i'll just say some of the most chart that i've seen that applies to the ak is typically it's either Romanian or Serbian. I mean, I've seen some stuff, Russia and, and, and others, but for the most part, like you're predominantly going to see Russia or I'm sorry, uh, Romania and, and Serbia or Yugo stuff uh, coming from the Balkans conflicts. And uh, most common is going to be on the Romanian dongs. So I'm holding one up here. I don't know if you guys can see it, but uh, this is Christina and they really liked to put names in them. And this one's actually got a couple of names. It's got Laura, Christina, and then on the back side, McCall or something like that. And it's really kind of angled on there. 
And this piece is kind of interesting because the handwriting or the type of carving is different on the two sides. So it's almost like maybe it had a different owner at another time. I don't know. I think that's what's fascinating about trench art is you, you don't know the story, but there's definitely something there. This one's Yugoslavian. Uh, it says Elko. And what I get from um, what Elko mean? this is, I have no idea. I'm sure it's a name. What I, um, and this is completely my, just from my observations, all the, um, or I shouldn't say all, but majority of the time when I see block lettering like this, that's really hollowed out kind of thick, it's typically Yugoslavian carving, carvings that do that. I don't know why, I couldn't tell you, but um, I have a MG42 stock that has VUK, which means wolf in Serbian, and it's in that same style. Um, usually when I see that style, it's on, on Yugoslavian stuff. So that's kind of my only, Maybe they knowledge on that, I guess. Yeah, I don't know. This Maybe. one here, this is this is Alina. Or I'm sorry, this is what is this one? Sorry, this is Dorina. Again, also on the uh, oops, let me move it that way. Also on the dong, and then on the stock on this rifle is uh, a bunch of stickers. There's a cartoon. And what year did they start making stickers? I, I don't know. And 60s. I, I've been under the impression that a lot of these stickers came from like candy packs, like bubble gum and stuff. Yeah. Uh, this this Mitsubishi 3000 GT looks to definitely be kind of that speed. And then like an 80s also on sticker. Totally. Absolutely. And on this side, it's a, uh, a Ferrari and also from the 80s style so i'm gonna guess these were probably out of a bubble gum type thing and they were maybe a whole series of cars who knows but the uh, the sticker thing seems to be pretty common on the romanians as well so i've got some examples here on my screen so they even did magazines and can you guys see these yep yep so here's a, a magazine and it's got some sort of name or something written on there in whatever language that is. I don't know. C A W B E H maybe. Yeah. Here's a pair. And I think this goes back to what Tony was talking about where they were marking uh, their equipment because this has the same markings on both. That could be somebody's name there, possibly. Could be his girlfriend or something. Could be, but a way for him to mark and say, hey, dudes, these are my mags. Keep your mitts off of them kind of thing. It could be his buddy's wife. You never know. There's a better picture of the one you were showing, your, your Dorina. <laughs> yeah. There's those stickers you were talking about. Did you know what the, what is that a sticker of that purple green? I have never been able to figure that out. It's some cartoon looking thing. It's like a fairy. I don't know. Tinkerbell. Yeah, it's, that, that, that's, it's, it's, it's definitely what? some Tinkerbell looking thing. Rabbit. I don't like, know. Like a frog or a rabbit. And then there's know. the the Ferrari side. Here's. Is this one you sent me, or is this somebody else's? Yeah. Yeah, that's the MG42. That says wolf in uh, in Serbian. VUK means wolf? Yeah. Nice. And that's a thicker carving like you were talking about. James, yeah. is that wire on there um, on the, the last photo of the Serbian stock? Is that a repair or is that decorative? Like a lot of times people well, wrap stuff in a wire like that if it splits but it's not obvious that that's what's going on here. So I'm actually not sure. I have um, I have a couple different um, kits like that and they all the stocks are are like that. So I'm not sure if that's just how they were or probably for reinforcement. Or what. But um, I know that on those MGs that there's also like black, uh, I guess, polymer type stocks as well. So all the wood ones I've seen that wire. Yeah, that's actually on the on violins, um, that's what the purfling is, the 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 black, white, black laminate going around the rim. That's mm -hmm. actually 
on a, on a good violin, um, the way I was taught, that's pear wood, and you boil pear wood in iron salts to turn it black like that, and then laminate it into into the trilam, and then you cut a groove in, and that's been around since I think the time of Stradivari and and the rest. And what it does is it keeps the end grain from checking, right? From doing this, from splitting, splitting. So binding it like that makes some sense in a particular context, but I don't understand exactly why on that one. So that's cool. I'll have to check it out next time. I'm well when I finally get out to your way. Yeah, yeah we're still waiting. <laughs> is this one you sent me, James? Yes, I did. Now that's that's a diff. That's definitely an interesting piece and kind of takes us pre AK, of course. But that's from a uh, a uh, 1863 carbine, so that would have been the rifle used in the Battle of Little Bighorn. And uh, what's interesting about that that you're seeing is those circles with little dots in the middle. Mm-hmm. In that era, when Native Americans got their hands on rifles, they would press brass tacks in them and create patterns. And I don't really know why, like what the, if there was some, if they were just doing it for decor, decoration or if they had some specific purpose on how they oriented them, but they would create very unique patterning, basically almost beadwork on the, on the wood. And so that rifle that you're looking at was owned by a Native American at some point, either through trade or by winning, you know, picking up in a battle. Um, and then on that first picture you showed of it, there was actually some initials carved in the back of the stock. So um, those could have been, it says AEA, those could have been the, uh, you know, the initials of the guy that was, it was originally issued to, or, you know, who knows. So mm-hmm. um, probably unlikely that the AEA was related to the Native American, but um, so there's probably several owners of that long before it found its way into my collection. But um, yeah, and then when we talk trench art, I think the brass tacks are a pretty cool, pretty yeah. cool thing to bring and, up. And you see a lot of in that era as well in the pistol grips where the cowboys and the the war the um the what are they called the soldiers thank you would uh, engrave things in the the pistol grips the butt stocks of their rifles um Mm -hmm. they seem to be um pretty prevalent back in those days as well and that would i think that would be trench art too if that should be considered yeah I, I absolutely believe it and i i think it kind of even fits with what we were talking about earlier as far as some of it being boredom related to a lack of canvas um you know a lot of that stuff's you know out west where it's a lot more primitive and more frontier than you know back east because you know you're talking civil war had just ended things like that so the the supply lines out this way would have been far less and uh you wouldn't have access to things to maybe do your you know, to, to occupy your time or to do your artwork on. Right. And then, of course, the Indians, I mean, they were famous for, you know, their their war decorations and stuff. Yeah, absolutely. So these are just some I found across the, the interwebs. Um, very elaborate uh, carving there. So that's Yugo. That's Yugo. And that's the other thing I would, I would bring up on Yugo is I have seen an awful lot of uh of stuff like that where they're doing the um what's that called coat of arms and and crest uh Mm -hmm. stuff like that that seems to be very common so you know the Serbs probably had a lot of pride in their in their nation or in their crest to uh go to those lengths i mean because that's that's very detailed those are yeah you can imagine sitting there with a knife trying to carve that well and probably what they did too is had some sort of a stencil that they could put over that and then trace over it and you know Mm-hmm. Kind of like I, doubt that, I doubt that they did that just freehand. Right, but, but still the, taking a knife and carving that's going to be, sure. a, you know, that's going to be a project. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, or whatever. Uh, another are. neat, uh, another neat one. I don't know if you have it, how many pictures you got left, but uh, was very well. I don't know how common, but I see them pop up from time to time, but never for sale. Is uh, putting pictures of of the pretty ladies of the day on the on the stocks or even the handguards, and they just kind of like glued them on just like the sticker thing. Okay. Um, I've seen people post their private collections of things like that, but you almost never see them for sale. Yeah. Here's another one with the, the tax, like you were talking about. So if this is on a, yep. on a That's interesting. Yeah, that's a very cool piece. That's really cool. Here's there you go. Stick. 
That looks like a lady one. Yep, yeah, that's a lady one. That's that's the stuff I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. <laughs> but that looks like a Madonna or something. Related to that is, um, you know, most what parts of the former com block that aren't uh, Muslim were, as far as I know, generally orthodox. And uh, you can find a bunch of photos and videos out there of orthodox priests blessing um, the AKs of the troops and uh, orthodox Christians once a year, as far as I know, um, will will make holy water. And, uh, you know, so they'll they'll put in a splash um, from the Jordan River and then the priest will mix it and bless it. And uh, babushkas will show up with like two five gallon buckets and haul a, a year's worth of of uh, holy water back home. And, you know, they throw a little in the laundry, a little in the dishes, that kind of thing. And um, along similar lines is, yeah, there's there's these awesome photos of Orthodox priests um, with this sort of flog. It's like a almost like a horsehair whip kind of thing. And they stick it in the bucket and then they fling um, they fling the water and they'll do it. They go to every parishioner's house as well and they'll fling the holy water around once a year. But really cool to see. The, the mixing, you know, the, the Orthodox kind of do iconography in a really beautiful way. Mm -hmm. To see that mixed with the AK is kind of fun. Yeah. Here's an example of a uh, shell casing that uh, somebody elaborately cut out, cut a uh, silhouette of, it looks like a priest, maybe holding it's a baby. It's like the baby, baby with the Madonna and the baby. Yeah, it's like a priest holding a baby. So it's like a priest robe. Anyway, uh, I mean, they they got some of these guys had access to some some good tools and could make this stuff. And this could have been a civilian aftermarket thing right here too that they made in a shop. Um, One thing I was noticing earlier, like there's a lot of people that do can art now, where they'll take like an empty pop can and then Scotch Bright the outside so that it's just smooth aluminum. And aluminum is very ductile, meaning it flows very well. And they'll do this thing with their thumb where they'll just rub it smooth and they'll make all these cool shapes. And I suspect that's what's going on with all those shell casings. Somebody had like a end of a broom handle or something like that, where they're making that heavy fluting. I'm almost positive that's handmade by just rubbing it back and forth over and over and over right. again. Yeah. Like those hobo nickels. Have you ever seen those? A hobo, no, a hobo nickel. Oh, look at the hobo nickel. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I need to Google. Let me Google this. Go ahead and talk about it, and I'll find one. It was just, uh, you know, the the people riding the trains back in the days, they would get, like, buffalo head nickels, and they'd carve them into, like, skulls and Whoa. stuff like that, and they, they would trade it amongst themselves. And it, it, it was it's a form of trench art in, in itself, just not war-related, but it's it all falls on the same category. Oh, yeah, that's extraordinary. I actually used to make these. Uh, I made a few for my kids. Um, you can take a, they're these cool, I think they're called a jeweler saw. It's a, it's like a cross between a coping saw and um, um, and a hacksaw, a really thin, fine blade with fine teeth. And there are people that go and they will cut around the buffalo to make it a silhouette and they'll leave the rim of the nickel and, you yeah. know, out in the middle and they are really fun to make i highly recommend going after it because those buffalo nickels are they're only like 50 cents a piece or something if you go into a coin shop they're not worth that much um, really? even though I think they're, right. they're super cool but uh yeah as in terms of numismatic value uh coin collecting value they're not a normal buffalo nickel is not hard to come by there's one of chucky <laughs> yeah it's still going on today it's it's uh it's a, it's a really cool history about it but it's it's you know something to look into that is very cool yeah definitely for the for those folks listening that's that's a search term to remember and look at later i'm blown away at the yeah, cool. really yeah. cool part here there's loki very cool oh that's yeah cool. I bet there's probably examples of that with the foreign currency, you know, that that soldiers got from overseas too. I don't know. I don't yeah, know. I soldiers saw, would do it too. I saw a pretty cool like choker necklace that um, from World War II 
that had a uh, an iron cross in the middle and then it had Russian coins making up the strap going around the uh, the forming forming the Joker band, whatever you call that. Uh, interesting collision of cultures. That was cool. Yeah. So I was I was on the AK forum and I did a search for trench art. You guys ever been to the AK forum? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. So um, you can go there and there's some people that are selling the um, the trench art AK furniture there. They've got you know you can find some more information about it. Let's see if I can find this one with a mirror on it. There it is. Yeah, that's a good one. That there's, I mean, it's really hard to prove. If yeah, the provenance is probably the biggest part that determines value. If there's yeah. no provenance, then anybody could have done it. Well, let's talk about that because that's one of the questions is, uh, does the trench art add value or devalue the, I think, the weapon or the fire? I think it. I think it does add value, but not on a grand scale. I think it's on a minor scale. And because it doesn't add a significant value, um, I think that actually limits the amount of forgery. Because if you think what it would go into to take a, like I say, a dong stock, carve a name into it and make it look like it was hand carved, you probably have to hand carve it. Then you got to go through some lengths to patina it and make it look like it wasn't just done. And by the time you go through that effort to jack the price on the on the dong, maybe twenty to thirty dollars, it's not worth your time. So I I do think that the there is a they do drive more of a price because people, and it's not not everybody. A lot of a lot of AK buyers don't want their gun to look like it's got tattoos all over it. But the fine wine drinking AK people have been around a little while that they're excited about that and they're going to bid higher for it and they're going to bid against each other, but it's not significantly higher. So I think there's kind of a nice symbiotic relationship there right now where it's like, hey, I'll pay more, but I'm not gonna overpay because I don't, you know, what if it is a fake? And then because we're not overpaying, people aren't really going to the great lengths to fake them. So right now I think there's a good balance, but that's just my thoughts. I yeah. agree. I've seen, again, like you said, it's not that much, but they tend to go, they do tend to sell for more. I've seen the kits that have the the trench art versus the ones that don't, and they go, you know, they ten, fifteen dollars higher or whatever. Just depends on the, um, I guess the, what's on it. Yeah, he's the, the the art, yeah, art, you know what it is and and whatnot. But, um, so for those that get that, you know, you get one, and you're wanting to, you know, whether whether you should sand it off or not, um, don't. Don't do that. Don't touch it because that's, you know, tip, typically that's going to be history. Again, you can't prove it. And those that you can prove are going to be worth even more. So if you've got the, like Tony was saying, the prominence and you can prove, you know, you've got pictures, you've got history of the piece, uh, that's really going to drive the price uh, way up, especially for, you know, the collectors that are into that uh, or if it's on an auction or something like that. That, I mean, that, that goes for even just the, you know, just a dirty, a dirty kit or, or having, you know, dents and dings in it. Um, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to have battlefield carvings, but, you know, there's plenty of new production furniture out there you can get to make your pretty gun. But when you get the dirty stuff, there's a market for the dirty stuff. And it's they like that. Sure, there's a lot of it out there, but. You know, there's a lot of it out there, but the people that are that have it are hoarding it, and because they know they can't get it no more. So, uh, you know, if you don't want the dirty stuff, there's plenty of people out there that do. So, um, definitely don't ruin the dirty stuff by cleaning it. Speaking of clean stuff, uh, yeah, what? we got Occam on the show here today. <laughs> he's, he's like rubbing in our face right now. He's like, yeah, look what I got. Oh, yeah, uh, right hand man Cody standing off off camera building oh. up the guns for this week, doing final assembly. And uh, yeah, we do a double, a buddy check on on most stuff around here. And so, uh, yeah, we've been, he's been uh, bringing a couple by and just checking feel and all that. We did, we did hold all of our stuff. And, and so I'm just checking feel and, is, you know, tension on the safety, that kind of thing. 
did Cody paint that one specifically? Yes. Is, he, is the paint is the paint clean on it? Is it clean? Is it like perfect? Like there's no there's no mishaps or anything. It's just perfect. It's 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 way nicer than what I've ever seen out of your shop. And so yeah, I'd say so. <laughs> so. <laughs> Um, can I buy that one? Because I'm going to carve that shit out of it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm no. going to trench art that James, thing. <laughs> James actually trained us how to do Cerakote. So, you know, uh, Cody Cody is a disciple of of uh, Montactical and Freedom Stencils, uh, as am I to the degree that I'm able to Cerakote at all. Hey, so let's let's get to the listener questions now. Right and, on. Um, all right. We've got them on Instagram and Facebook. And I gave, I think I gave everybody enough time this time to really get in there and and hit us with a bunch of questions. So I'll go to Facebook first. Let me refresh it. <clears throat> and we'll go to the first one here. So I got 13 or so here on Facebook. Brett Badal says, please discuss how trench art correlates with each country's customs and or religious religious beliefs. Do any NATO countries do trench art? Is all of this done crudely, knife, bayonet, or is some more sophisticated? I think we kind of answered most of those. Um, yeah. I mean, the, the trench art is going to be reflective of each individual. So, uh, you know, I'm sure there's some religious uh, type trench art out there, carvings in the AKs, um, customs, you know, whatnot. NATO countries do trench art. I mean, we kind of talked about that too. Yeah. Um, Polish. Yeah. Um, well, America did it. Australians did it. Um, you know, I think any, British, anybody, anybody, everybody's just, done it. If there's wood, they just not even wood. Anybody, everybody does art. Right. It's it's yeah. you know what you do. And it's We're not just wood. Belong to it. Any material, it could be wood, it could be metal, it could be plastic, Just even putting, putting even, stickers on. Yeah, World War, uh, was it World War Two where the, uh, the planes the had the plastic, what was that no, plastic stuff nose called? Nose art. Are you um, talking about the they nose collide. art on the planes where they painted the pictures? Pin up no, art and, about, and all no, that? No, no, it's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the the plastic shit that they used. It's not plastic, but bake it was light. Light. not bake light. America. Plexiglass? Plexiglass. Oh, lucite. Oh, might be. Lucite, plexiglass, yeah, whatever. Yeah, they yeah. would even use plexi plexiglass to make trench art. They would make bracelets and medallions and, and things out of the the, the the plexiglass. So crazy. Any, yeah, I mean, we even saw coconuts. They use coconuts, you know, for right. guys. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my uh, one of my grandfathers was uh, an award-winning wood carver, and when he passed away, um, I inherited his tools. I'm like, oh man, this is going to be amazing. I bet the steel is great and all that. And it was the gnarliest, like cheapest steel, randomly ass tools I had ever seen. And he had like screwdrivers that he had ground down and um, made into hook. You know. Um, like carving hooks and stuff and it's crazy i've since started to do that and you can make really nice tools out of broken tools and so it would not surprise me at all if a bunch of these uh things were carved with just you know a broken screwdriver or something yeah and here's some examples a lot of them use like those uh those little can openers, what are those called? those p38 or what have been gi uh not probably not ak countries Oh, they had the same type. Of, well, not, not the same can opener, but like a little can opener is what I researched that they used, a lot of them used. Yeah, well, they used, uh, you know, the 50 BMG they could make. That's where the, this is a modern day one. This isn't one, I think Lucky Shot. This one came from Lucky Shot USA. Lucky Shot USA is a great website. They, they do modern, like, reproductions of uh, actual trench art. Um, if you guys go check them out, we've had them on the show a few years back. I actually tried to get him on the show too, but uh, it was too short notice to get that guy on. But he's a he's a wealth of knowledge. But I was talking about pe plexiglass, and here's some examples of some art that was done uh, with the plexiglass. 
during World War II. Um, so that question was Brett Bedal. Um, Nathan Shepard, what was the coolest trench art y'all have ran across? What country was the origin? What kits tend to have the most art? What would you say, James? Uh, I mean, this, the coolest stuff, to, in my opinion, is this, like I say, the stocks that have the pictures of the ladies on them. Um, I've not been lucky enough or fortunate enough to get my hands on any. Like I said earlier, the people that have them like to show them off and rub my nose in it, but they certainly <laughs> won't part with any. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but those are those are those are my favorite, and uh, as I think the second part of this question I do with countries that I I I think typically that's more of a Romanian thing, um, and uh, if I ever if I got my choice of what country to get my hands on for it, it would probably be Romanian. But yeah, uh, Ed Burton says, "What country produces the most trench art? What war or conflict? I think World War One is probably probably yeah." Better. I would say hands down. Yeah, and if we're talking uh, AK specific, then I would say Balkans conflict, Romania, and then Yugo. But otherwise, yeah, yeah World War One. Let's see, Connor Norris. If I were to add my own carved and painted trench art to my AK, what would be the best method to do so? Anything I should know about working with the wood stocks and whatever shellac might be on it? or how best to seal my work when I'm done. So first off, I, I would, let me say this, I would not, if it's original wood, you know, I would not mess with it at all. Uh, if you want to do some artwork of your own, go buy one of these uh, aftermarket um, wood kits. Yeah, new production. Yeah. I would get new production, then I would sharpen my teeth and I would carve it with my teeth. <laughs> and then and then and then rub it down with some motor oil and cosmoline and leave it in the sun for like two months and then mount it on your gun <laughs> maybe throw it in the dryer with some poker chips first i don't know <laughs> nice did i just tell people how to fake trench damn it <laughs> you just did it you just did it you gave the secret <laughs> man what about you brian <laughs> what's your suggestion on that for connor what? Well, I think James has it kind of right that that you don't want to do too clean a job of hardly anything. Um, you know, for wood treatments, I'm a big fan of. Actually, I got a good one for you. I, I apprenticed on a tall ship for for uh, for a summer when I was a kid, and we used to have to deal with all the woodwork on there. Like dealing with the wood was an everyday thing, and uh, we used something they called fifty fifty. And it's a mix, it's half turpentine and half linseed oil. And you don't want to use turpentine in indoors, even though it's derived from pine trees, it'll make you really dull. Like it's, it's something about it is fairly neurotoxic. If you huff the hell out of it, ask me how I know, like just working bent over something for forever. Um, but that has the same look to it that cosmoline and oil soaking does. And so that might be a good way to get that that gnarly oil, but kind of plasticky sealed look to it. Very similar look. Very nice. Austin Whalen wants to know, how often is the art a naked lady? <laughs> These questions. Dude, I have no idea. I'm going to say less than 20%. I'll even say less than that. I mean, it, we're talking, again, I'm talking specifically just uh, those two countries, the Balkans countries, I would say less than 20% just of those countries. So in AK all encompassingly, it's pretty small. Yeah. Here's an interesting question. Have you ever seen trench art that had classified information on it? Uh, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't know. <laughs> I wouldn't know if it's social was, security. I, I, <laughs> it it didn't Black. say classified and then say what it is, though. Yeah. So I don't know. Yeah. It's, just, it's, it's not just, classified anymore, but it yeah. is. <laughs> For your eyes only. Secret classified. For your eyes only, only, Alina. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go to Instagram here. Take a couple of questions from the Grams. And Brian, are you on Instagrams? 
I will be shortly. What are you guys? What are you guys read? My, my favorite Tony. one on here. Tony, I want you to what read. Was that? You read one. Oh, I don't read. I don't know if Tony can read. Uh, he came on the show. He's not that. He doesn't have that kind of aptitude. <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> Yes, yes. Oh, have you ever been able to track down uh, who who a piece of trench art belonged to, name or rank or anything like that? No, but you know there was a, a little while back. Well, I guess it's been a while now, but they uh, did some buyout of the Glocks that the Detroit Police Department used to carry, and they they're interesting because on the side they say Detroit Police Department, where it would say Glock, and they did like some buyout and they sold them through a distributor. And so I ended up with one and I went into a bunch of forums and tried to find the original owner guy. Cause I mean, these things were like worked over, you know? And so I was trying to find the original owner and I always thought it'd be cool to like pair it back with the cop who carried it. But as far as trench art, no. I think it'd be cool to set up like a website. Of, Here's my trench art. If you were the original owner, send a picture of you holding it. If that even exists or something kind of trash history together but i still think that's almost an impossible yeah can you imagine how rare and they're probably I, I mean, dead. dead or yeah or just that forgot question, about it you know that question came from john adams the third uh here's one that's not related to um trench art this is from sack archer it says has story. anyone talked to the ar guys since the ak corner <laughs> just figured someone should make sure they're okay uh, after such a public spanking. <laughs> I love that question. I read it like five times. I've been over here giggling the whole time. I have certainly not followed it up with any of them, no. I have. <laughs> I have, and they want a rematch. They're talking rematch. <laughs> Definitely. They did, they did do great, though. I learned a ton. Oh, yeah. I like, I like the team hopping, too. There was, there was some team hopping going on there, too. Yeah, yeah I was definitely not pleased someone. about the team hopping. Curtis Halstrom is dead to me. <laughs> He's fired. <laughs> hey, speaking of, is he okay? I, I saw where he um, caught ill, got some kind of virus or something. I don't know. You hear, see or hear about that? Yeah, oh, he, he caught the AR virus. The AR virus. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Curtis, if you're listening, I hope you're okay. Uh, pick one there, Brian. Pick you a good, good question there. Um, a solid place for somebody to find trench art at. Um, you know, that's a, there's there's a there's a pile on eBay. Who I'll read? Who, that. who asked that? <laughs> who asked that question? That was Sack them. Archer as don't well. Don't tell them. Okay, yeah, Sack right. Archer. So the the AK form I was talking about earlier, <laughs> that's a place where you can go. Um, and if you can't find any there, you can post up a question and somebody will probably direct you uh, probably 500 different places that we've never heard of that you know could be very useful to you. But yes, eBay uh, is a great place to look. Um, just Google, you know, Google it. And, uh, but word of mouth is usually the best way. So go on some of these AK forums and just ask around. Uh, most of those guys on there seem to be pretty helpful. What's another question? Pick another one there, Tony. Uh, okay. Oh, geez. Just read that, Jesse, one there. All right. Did soldiers make it to try and sell it afterwards, or was it meant to kill time? time. Definitely going to look after for some. Episode. And I have my glasses. So. Okay. All right. So that's from I'll, Jesse Bedell. Yep, and I'll take that uh, uh, one. Um, I think there's a little of both there. Like, if you're talking specifically trench art, you know, on, on weaponry or parts of the weapons, it was more to kill time or for other various reasons, like, you know, um, religious reasons or, you know, family commemoration, things like that. But um, the type of trench art, like we showed a little bit ago, where you're doing just art on other things scraps that were laying around you know leftovers of a mortar or whatever uh some of that stuff was probably absolutely well i know for a fact because i've seen it with my own eyes used to be 
sold or traded. Um, like I know in in more modern times, like the more most recent Operation Iraqi Freedom stuff, you could whip up some pretty cool little souvenirs of your own with your own American twist, take it to the local flea market and barter with the flea market guys to get your own mementos of their culture to take home or to send home. So yeah. there was some pretty cool, unique little things like that, that really, as we've gone through this episode, I've kind of just, I forgot about for years and it's triggered in my mind. So um, like, I know for a fact, I've done a lot of that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, so, I'm glad you said that too, because that was another reason why they did it was to barter. You know, people would make yeah. trade for smokes or vice versa or food or, you know, they would go to the the local town there and they would trade for, you know, for other items there. So yeah, that, you know, currency, Absolutely. it was used as currency. And, and if very effectively, like depending on what you wanted to get, you know, like Iraq, for example, they love Pepsi and some Pepsi at the chow hall. And then you go, you know, make up some cool little trinket that doesn't take you very long to whip up, but it has some, you know, it's very American, very, very Western. And you take that to the local flea market, you're walking in there with, you know, like a suitcase full of money. You can come out with an Xbox and a couple video games and go back to your tent, you know? So there's some, uh, yeah, I think, I think it's the answer to his question is both. And it's a she. She, sorry. Jesse, Who was it again? Jesse Bedow. Jesse Bedow 04. Yep. So, Jesse, yeah, answer to the answer to her questions both. She's a newer listener, um, and she's uh, just getting into the uh, AK competition shooting. Ooh, welcome to the club. That's <laughs> sweet. Yeah. That's nice. I don't do that. That's badass. <laughs> so let's take one more. Uh, and then we'll start giving away our, our prizes, which we're going to be giving away a SEAL 1 uh, package. We're going to be giving away a Mission First Tactical Dump Tray, AK Corner Dump Tray. Uh, James is going to be giving away an AK Corner uh, Tumbler. And I need a big one. This one's too small. I, I, I drink my whiskey too fast through this. Which right. is the, the print on the back and the front, just like our shirt <laughs> and our hoodies. We'll send it with your when our new design the shirt coming your way we'll nice. hit you up this week nice uh and then uh one of these shirts he's gonna be giving one of the ak corner shirts and this uh and then brian is going to be giving away did you confirm what you're gonna yeah so we've spun off occam lube into a separate company because making lube and making guns in the same building is dumb and uh so uh our mute our all three of us i think are are uh our friends with uh with Buell Collins, he's running the the show over there now, and hey he to says Buell. that uh, all uh, all leadies get uh, the Talking Lead ten percent off uh, coupon code, and the coupon code is all caps Leadhead. Nice. Yeah, and uh, we're going to be giving Get away uh, OccamLube.com, and uh, we're also going to be giving away two DIY kits. So uh, uh, that's a lubrication delivery system that is suitable for anything that can go in a syringe. So hand cream to slip 2000 to whatever you want. Very cool. So all you lead heads get to benefit, go to that website, uh, occamlube.com. Yep. O C C A M as in mama lube.com. Uh, and you use the code capital leadhead, all caps, 10% off, very nice and then we're going to give away two kits that we said that's correct two kits very cool so we got a lot of cool giveaways here so let's get into it and let's pick some people who haven't won before so brian look through there on instagram are you guys on facebook at all anybody on facebook i haven't we're on facebook but i'll while james is looking at facebook let's do uh sack archer has he won anything um, I think he has, but I don't know if he's won anything lately. Well, uh, that I think that question about uh, acknowledging the obvious trouncing that the AR guys took is it is a good. He, I think good question. <laughs> yes, he, gets, <laughs> he gets the Occam lube. Sounds good. Kit. So, uh, Sack Archer, and all the winners, shoot me an email if we announce your name. Talkinglet at gmail dot com. And say this episode, Talking Lead, AK Corner, Season 3, Episode 7, Trench Art, something like that. Winner in the 
in the title, but tell me what you won also, because I'm not going to remember what you won. But we're going to need your address also. Don't just say, hey, I won. We're going to need somewhere to send it. Uh, and if it's a shirt or you know, clothing, give me your size. So there's winner number one. Congratulations, Sack Archer. Winner number two is going to get... Let's give away the the tumbler this time, Brian. I'll let you or James. I'll let you pick. Uh, are we? Uh, I mean, I know I'm on the Facebook, but uh, can I still pull from the Instagram or no? You can pull from Instagram. Has has uh, has has Jesse been a recent winner? Uh, Jesse won last episode. Oh, something, okay. I think. Uh, okay. We got enough. We can we can spread the love. Well, I I really liked that that, that oh, question. Oh, actually, I think she was one of the shirts. Provoked a thought. Oh, really? Okay. I was gonna say yeah. that, that 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 question provoked that thought that brought me back to something that I, I thought was really kind of cool and relevant, and that that I totally forgot about. Um, so I thought that was a good one. But uh, let me uh, we can let me see here. Welcome, Lube. Since you won a shirt last time. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like that. Let's. Uh, uh, I picked Jesse for something just because that question. Well, you pick somebody, took, you pick took, somebody for the tumbler. It took me down my my past. All right, for the tumbler, let me see here. Um, okay, this, this one just because it's funny. Seth Russell, how prevalent is a dong carved on a dong foregrip? Asking for a friend. <laughs> <laughs> Who is that? <laughs> Sam Russell on Facebook. <laughs> Sam Russell. Okay, there you go, Sam. You win <laughs> the Factory 47 AK Corner Tumblr. Shoot me an email with all the info. Congratulations. And then, Jesse, you win the, the second Occam Lube. So uh, send me your info again. I know I got it, but um, you got to send it to me again. Sorry. I'm going to pick the winner for the dump tray. What in the world was that? Sorry, I let a little toot out. Was that a toot? Oh, no, it was. It was the door closing, but it sounded better as a as a toot. Hey, I actually got to uh, make a request here. You don't have to honor it. Okay. But Jerry Black, the question with the Have you ever seen trench art that has classified information on it? I actually absolutely have. Uh-oh. Uh oh. As we were going through the Ooh. show today, there was. Um, you know, like a lighter that had engraved on it the dude's name, the date, and the Ypres, which was one of the gnarliest battles of World War One. And I guarantee that that was classified information at the time. And that's not the only one I've seen like that, because, you know, you're not allowed to talk about where you are and when you're there and all that. So I think that was actually, he was right. It exists. Okay. So you don't have to honor my request to give him a prize, but... He's a big fan and also has bought one of my guns. So I'm going to say, hey. Does he have one of your shirts? I don't think he does. So let, yeah. I'll let's hook send him. him let's send him one of your shirt. And he's like a 2X or 3X. He's a big boy. He's tall. He's not. He's he not is big. Fine. Yes, yeah. he is too. Yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's bigger than you. Didn't I meet him at the. Yeah, he, at the he, was, at, yeah, he was at the uh, 212 thing we did. I don't know. He's felt compared to me, but yeah, we'll we'll throw him a two X. That'll be well, great. I'm just saying, he's oh, he's yoked. Yeah, yeah. he's yoked. He ain't fat. Yeah, he's either two X or three X. I don't know. He's big. Okay, cool. We'll get with him. He's a hoss. There you go, Jerry. Congratulations. You get uh, Aachen Defense T-shirt, and I'm looking for a winner for the what I say. Don't Trey. Let's go with. I don't think Shane Hammond. I don't recall saying his name lately. So we'll go with Shane Hammond. I think Trench Art is interesting and gives the AK a unique look. Looking forward to the episode. So I hope we delivered for you, Shane. Uh, shoot me an email. You get the dump tray. And then I think the last, are we on the last giveaway with the seal? Seal one. Pack it here. Let's go to the Grams and see if anybody's on the grams that's new. And you said Sam Russell earlier. He won something, right? He won the the tumbler. He had the dong question. Yeah, the dong. Yep. What about your t-shirt? 
Looks like Gunner. Gunner something. I can't read that. Who's got good eyes? Put my glasses back on. Gunner Bab X B A B I C Z. Was trench art more common in some countries or conflicts than others? It seems like there is a disproportionate amount of trench art on Yugo furniture. You may want to comment on that. Can you read it one more time? It says, was trench art uh, more common in some countries or conflicts than others? It seems like there is a disproportionate amount of trench art on Yugo furniture. Yeah, I think we kind of covered that as far as, you know, like or once for uh, earlier, but uh, specifically relating to AK, I think it's, to me, it's pretty Means. equally divided between Yugo and Romania. And it's really, really hard to kind of give one an edge over the other. And then I guess conflict would, of course, be the Balkans again. Yeah. There you go, Gunner. Bab X G U N N A R B A B I C Z U one the SEAL 1 Complete Gun Care Kit, uh, CLP. SEAL 1 and done. You apply it once, you wipe it off, and uh, you're good to go with the SEAL 1. All right, guys. Anything else to add on our, our trench art? Let's wrap it up here. That's it. Thanks for having well, us really again. I uh, love it. Absolutely. I, I really learned a lot in researching this. Uh, I didn't realize how big trench art was um, from World War One, World War Two. I knew that it existed, but, you know, I learned a lot about that. And it was very interesting and found some good links and good sites. I will put those in the show notes, uh, especially the um, National World War Two Museum. You go to National ww2 the number two museum.org um you can go there and you see some pretty cool stuff and like i said they've got that exhibit going on right now up until the first of the year and it's in new orleans you guys can go check that out it's probably pretty cool they've got a virtual one uh, online that you can um, give you a little sample of what's going on there um but definitely if you find trench art if you're out there and you're buying an ak you're buying the furniture and it's got you know, this trench art on there, um, buy it. I mean, it's going to be, you're going to be glad you did. Uh, there's going to be some sort of history there. You might be able to research and find, you know, what's going on with it. Get in touch with James. He could probably give you some good tips and tricks uh, on identifying the the markings and whatnot oh. that's on there. Or you can just sell it to me. That's cool, too. <laughs> well, I was going to say, he might even offer to buy it. <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe barter, you know, trade trade. Barter, yeah. I can draw you a new picture to trade out with. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe a nice AK corner tumbler, you know, something like that. That's that's a good barter right there. You know, I'm I'm just trying to help you out there, brother. Trying to help you out. Uh, that's a good one. But if you want to get into doing your own trench art, do your own. I think there was a question on here or somebody was asking uh, you know, if they if they were going to do it themselves, what, what what should they use? How should they do it? You know, buy new furniture. Don't buy old furniture. And to your heart's content, do it yourself. Don't send it to somebody to have it done unless you just, uh, you know, want something that's perfect. But, you know, that's the whole thing. It's something that means something to you and is is meaningful to you. And carve your own stuff in there. If it's the, your kids' names, if you're religious, you want to put a cross in there. If it's the Easter Bunny, maybe that's your favorite holiday. I mean, who who knows? Uh, but it tells a story. You know, trench art tells a story. And tell your own story. Don't don't get somebody else to do it. Do it yourself. You can carve in the Factory 47 logo and <laughs> post it on Instagram or whatever you want. You know, it's your own little. You know, we forgot to talk about a famous, famous trench art thing is from, from what? Wolverines? Oh, oh yeah. Red Dawn. Uh, yeah, actually, yeah, marking of your, your kills. Yeah, from Red Dawn. <laughs> yeah. How do you miss that? Yeah. No, that's, a good, that's a good point. Have you ever seen that on a, on a weapon? 
You know, it's hard, hard to say because like on a lot of the Romanian stuff, you see like little hash marks or X's and it could just, a lot of times on the front of the, uh, the dong. So it could just be texture. that they did it for a texture of some sort. It's really, and how do you ever know? You see hash marks, you automatically were programmed from Red Dawn to be like, wow, that's a kill count, you know? And it's wishful thinking because we think, man, that's cool, you know? But really, it's like hard to say. And I think could be one, could be the amount of time that they they were in a certain place. Or this one even has hash marks on the one side, and this is the one, the Elko one. But what do those mean? I mean, did he kill eight people, or is that he was in theater for eight months? You know, who knows? Uh, right. Right. But it's still cool. <laughs> <laughs> and if you you leadheads come across any interesting trench art, you know whether it's. Uh, AK related or just you know from from wherever, shoot a shoot a email to me talking at gmail dot com or private message me or something on the social meds. It's at talking lead. Uh, I'd like to see it. I'd like to see what you got. And uh, Brian, you got any parting words? Uh, appreciate everybody listening. And uh, you know it's a somewhat dark days for two A. So. You know, there's a bunch of good nonprofits out there that are acting on our behalf. You know, Firearms Policy Coalition, I don't know a ton about them, but they seem to be doing really good work. Um, anybody who hasn't submitted yet on the ATF uh, registry there for public comment on outlying braces, um, being complacent is not an option right now. So I know it's very easy to be cynical about the government. Believe me, I'm in the front of the line on that one. Um, however, uh, I think there's about 130,000 comments, and that should be 130 million comments. So uh, please. Are you on that site right now? What's up? Are you on that site right now? On the registry? No. Yeah. Uh, but I saw the. I saw who was it? SB Tactical put up some numbers today on the gram. Okay. So they've got a counter, and it tells you how many days are left. Um, I normally have it up, but I don't have it up right now. So, but there's still some time. There's still a few days left. Yep. So I think that's the that's the big message from my end. And um, we're we're making guns. Uh, if you'd like to buy a gun from us, we'd love to make one for you. Um, parts on our website. We actually have some new parts up. Um, pistons. Um, gosh, what else, Cody? Pistons, scope rails, uh, dust covers. Yeah, we've got dust covers. Uh, Scope rails is a new thing that we're adding. I did so much to get away from them, but people love them, and uh, we're building them for uh, a partner OEM, and we're selling them as well. So if you absolutely got to have a, have a scope rail, we'd, we'd love to sell you one. Interesting. Yeah. Very nice. So go check them out, occamdefense.com. Uh, occamlube.com is where you're going to use that lead head discount code. You're going to get 10% off. Uh, on the Occam Lube website, uh, and then go support our other sponsors, Mission First Tactical. Use the code LEADHEAD, get 20% off. SEAL1, SEAL1.net, use the code LEADHEAD, you're going to get 25% off. Nemo Arms, TL10, get you 10% off, and that's even on their firearms, you're going to get 10% off, which is unheard of uh, in this this market these days. That is amazing. Yeah, another Idaho company. Um, they make neat stuff, so check them out. And then, of course, uh, Factory 47, and that's factory with a K, F-A-K-T-O-R-Y 47.com. Use the code LEADHEAD. You're going to get 10% off, and that's where you're going to exclusively get the Talking Lead AK Corner apparel, mugs, uh, and maybe some other things soon to come. And uh, check out James's other cool products you got hats there you got you got all kinds of other stuff you got flags like you said what else you guys got there yeah we got hats flags tumblers, shirts hoodies we got patches all kinds of good stuff why don't i just do this pull it up here on my screen for ours nice. that are fortunate enough uh, to be watching the we've video. even we even have them broken into collections by country. So if you're like really into a specific country, we made it easy to find the products for you. So here's here's a quick sample for you 
lead heads. There's hats, trucker hats. Ooh, like that. Very nice. Very nice. Check them out, factory47.com. And then, of course, his new stuff will be up soon. When did you say that was going to be up? I don't have a definitive date yet, but hopefully in the next two weeks. And then just to show Brian off a little bit here, here's Occam's website. Got the beautiful picture of the 1775 front and center. Got a quick link to Occam Lube there. So you can just go to Occam Lube directly from OccamDefense.com. Click on it, boom. And this is where you're going to get the 10% off uh, the Occam Lube products there. Very nice. Very nice, guys. Very nice. Uh, am I forgetting anybody? IWI. Yes, IWI US. Um, and you two were a part of this. Jeremy made the announcement on the last AK Corner. We're going to be giving away a Galil Ace at NRA. That is a fine firearm. Galils are, uh, yeah. It's amazing. They're a really nice gun. That is amazing. So we haven't come up with how we're going to be giving that away yet. We're still working on that, uh, but that is going to be awesome. We're going to be set up at the Caltech booth. Uh, we'll probably go over to IWI uh, to give that away, um, but we're still working on that. But just so you know, that's that's coming. That's in the works. Somehow, some way, you're going to be giving away a Galil Ace from IWI US. So go thank Jeremy in advance right now. Go to their Instagram page, go to their Facebook page, go to their website, shoot them a message, and uh, tell Jeremy how awesome he is. And uh, maybe, who knows, uh, we'll give something else away in the near future. But that does it. Another episode of the AK Corner. This is the seventh of 12. We're knocking them out one by one. Just a few more to go in this season of the Talking Lead AK Corner. If you've got suggestions on topics, guests, whatever, Shoot me an email, talkinglead at gmail.com. Love to hear from you, leadheads, as always. Um, just tell me in the subject what you're talking about. That way it's easier for me to categorize and find. And uh, look forward to the next episode with Brian, maybe James. Who knows is, Who knows it's going to be on? We got any idea what the next episode is going to be about? What What month is this? Ju July? So July. August? I don't know what August is going to hold for us we'll see so if we're point. not all in um you know vaccine re-education camps we'll 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 find out in in august vaccine re-education camps <laughs> <laughs> very good uh until then lead heads shoot me uh your pictures of your trench art if you got them and suggestions for the show look forward to hearing from you brian thank you so much james thank you so much tony it was a pleasure meeting you you're welcome back anytime Thank you. Maybe you'll talk more next Thank time. You. I don't know. <laughs> you're intimidating or, or what? You put death a gun on this, man. I'm, I'm deaf and G. I'm just <laughs> keeping quiet. <laughs> but, but again, you've got a new podcast, too. Is Tony on your new podcast, James? Oh, yeah. There's a, there are, the Barbarians are a tribe. There's a, <laughs> there's a pretty good pile of us. I got you. I got you. Remind uh, us of the name of the podcast again, James. The American Barbarians. Nice. I think Brian and I need to be on that podcast. You are more than welcome. And uh, we will, uh, we're sure. recording a lot, so we'll hit you up. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Leadheads, we'll talk to you soon. Out.